Now, according to the evolution theory, uh, how did the male-female reproduction uh, come along? Is a good question that uh, I think is often overlooked, and it's over and it's overlooked by strong delusion. The biological imperative, as we all know, is to pass on genes. Most species on Earth use sexual reproduction. Why do this? There has to be some fundamental biological evolutionary reason for sexual reproduction. This has been one of the major questions in biology for a very long time. Evolution cannot explain it. I mean, it just somehow magically happened in the ooze. We cannot ma reproduce that experiment. It's like a miracle. They, it can't be reproduced. We don't see it happening. But that's what happened. And from that simplest one-cell life form, it reproduced itself. Things evolved. Now, let's take a closer look at who our ancestors were. A simple chemical circumstance led to one of the great moments in the history of our planet. There were many kinds of molecules in the primordial soup. Some were attracted to water on one side and repelled by it on the other. This drove them together into a tiny enclosed spherical shell, like a soap bubble, which protected the interior. Within the bubble, the ancestors of DNA found a home, and the first cell arose. It took hundreds of millions of years for tiny plants to evolve, giving off oxygen. But that branch didn't lead to us. Bacteria that could breathe oxygen took over a billion more years to evolve. From a naked nucleus, a cell developed with a nucleus inside. Some of these amoeba-like forms led eventually to plants. Others produced colonies with inside and outside cells performing different functions, becoming a polyp attached to the ocean floor, filtering food from the water, and evolving little tentacles to direct food into a primitive mouth. This humble ancestor of ours also led to spiny-skinned, armored animals with internal organs, including our cousin, the starfish. But we don't come from starfish. About 550 million years ago, filter feeders evolved gill slits, which were more efficient at straining food particles from the water. One evolutionary branch led to acorn worms. Another led to a creature which swam freely in the larval stage, but as an adult was still firmly anchored to the ocean floor. Some became living hollow tubes, but others retained the larval forms throughout the life cycle and became free-swimming adults with something like a backbone. Our ancestors now, 500 million years ago, were jawless, filter-feeding fish, a little like lampreys. Gradually, those tiny fish evolved eyes and jaws. Fish then began to eat one another. If you could swim fast, you survived. If you had jaws to eat with, you could now use your gills to breathe the oxygen in the water. This is the way modern fish arose. During the summer, some swamps and lakes dried up, so some fish evolved a primitive lung to breathe air until the rains came. Their brains were getting bigger. If the rains didn't come, it was handy to be able to pull yourself along to the next swamp. That was a very important adaptation. The first amphibians evolved, still with a fish-like tail. Amphibians, like fish, laid their eggs in water where they were easily eaten. But then a splendid new invention came along. The hard-shelled egg laid on the land where there were as yet no predators. Reptiles and turtles go back to those days. Many of the reptiles hatched on land never returned to the waters. Some became the dinosaurs. One line of dinosaurs developed feathers useful for short flights. Today, the only living descendants of the dinosaurs are the birds. The great dinosaurs evolved along another branch. Some were the largest flesh eaters ever to walk the land. But 65 million years ago, they all mysteriously perished. Meanwhile, the forerunners of the dinosaurs were also evolving in a different direction. Small, scurrying creatures, with the young growing inside the mother's body. After the extinction of the dinosaurs, many different forms developed. The young were very immature at birth, in the marsupials, the wombat, for example, and in the mammals. The young had to be taught how to survive. The brain grew larger still. Something like a shrew was the ancestor of all the mammals. One line took to the trees, developing dexterity, stereo vision, larger brains, and a curiosity about their environment. Some became baboons, but that's not the line to us. Apes and humans have a recent common ancestor. Bone for bone, muscle for muscle, molecule for molecule. There are almost no important differences between apes and humans. Unlike the chimpanzee, our ancestors walked upright, freeing their hands to poke and fix an experiment. We got smarter. We began to talk. Many collateral branches of the human family became extinct in the last few million years. We, with our brains in our hands, are the survivors. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. Let's look at it again compressing four billion years of evolution into 40 seconds.
those are some of the things that molecules do, given four billion years of evolution. And grew more complex. And that is natural. Even though when we look around, um, things break down and fall apart. They don't organize and repair on their own, unless it's a living thing. The simplest life form we know of today is not simple at all, but actually quite complex. So we know more than we did when the theory of evolution first came out. But now we say that these single cell um, things have ability to reproduce on their own. Now, if they could reproduce on their own with no care, um, without having to find a mate, uh, just boop, another one, and then boop, 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 boop. started billions of years ago with two single-celled creatures sharing a chance encounter in the primordial night. They meet, and genes are exchanged. That's what sex is all about. The moment is brief, but it leaves them a little bit stronger, a little more likely to survive and reproduce. Males and females came later, when random change produced a creature that was small and fast, which turned out to be an evolutionary advantage. Organisms with reproductive cells like that are called males. Their goal is to find organisms with a different specialty, providing the nutrients life requires. They're called females. These early pioneers evolved in time into sperm and eggs. Males produce sperm by the millions. With so many potential offspring, it doesn't pay to be fussy about eggs. A better strategy is to try to fertilize every egg you can. Eggs are more complex than sperm and take a larger investment of energy. Females make only a limited number of them. Fewer eggs mean fewer chances to pass on genes. And that means females, unlike males, do better if they're choosy. And why would anything ever change to a male-female reproduction, where the organs of the male and the organs of the female are very different? Each one supplying something the other one cannot do. The, the male giving half his chromosomes, the female giving half her chromosomes to create a whole a reproduction of themselves. Immersed as we all are in a culture that extols male courage, grace, self-confidence, passion, questioning the necessity of males is rare. Men almost never do it, and women do it most often in a fit of pique. But for evolutionary biologists, the question is real. Given the efficiency of cloning, why would any female put up with the complications of sexual reproduction? For starters, males can't bear offspring and rarely share the burden of raising them. Then there's the fact she only gets to pass on 50% of her genes. Not to mention all the time, energy, and bother involved in courting a mating. Now, all this, according to um, the theory of evolution, has to happen so gradually, like a redwood tree growing. You can't really see it happen. But the male evolved, and the female evolved, separate, but yet symbiotic. How did it work until it was complete? Enduring mystery. Why sex? To study the sexual process, which appears to be normal, predominant in most things, I study the diseases of sex, the pathologies of it. Because side by side in these same little puddles, we'll have sexual reproducers, we'll have asexual reproducers, all competing in these tiny little simple environments. Early on, Weinhoek discovered that 40% of the minnows in these pools were heavily infected with a parasite that causes black spot disease. The rest seemed relatively unaffected. When we brought them back to the laboratory and, and started counting the spots, we noticed, well, my goodness, this is really neat. The asexual reproducers were taking much higher loads of parasites than the sexual reproducers on average. Why should they be more parasitized than the sexual reproducers? They were living right beside, because they're all being exposed to the same parasites in the water. There should be no fundamental reason for their different parasite loads on these different kinds of, of animals, unless it had something fundamentally to do with being asexual versus being sexual. But what? Finally, it hit him. The Red Queen is an elegant idea. I think it's one of the great ideas since Darwin. And it goes back to a wonderful scientist, uh, Lee Van Valen, who basically asked about, does evolution stop when things get perfectly well adapted to their environment? He said, of course not. Evolution is a race. And it's You're living in a complex world, a world full of parasites, a world full of viruses and bacteria, predators, competitive species, all basically evolving too. And the moment any species stops evolving in response to these challenges and threats, it's doomed. The cloned fish have stopped evolving. They're an easy target, especially for a short-lived, fast-evolving parasite. But the sexual fish are a moving target. Each is a new combination, fashioned from its parents' genes. 